Today on the show, my Grange is better. It's better than yours, and I won. Welcome to Lore Party, the podcast that explores the stories, characters, and universes behind some of our favorite video games. My name is Leo. And my name's Abu. And Leo, I don't want to get too personal right off the bat here, but uh, are you compensating with that Grange display? I, how dare you, Abu, <laughs> insinuate that my Grange is compensating. <laughs> I'm not going to pretend I didn't have to look up what Grange meant, but no. It's not about the size of a man's Grange. It's about the quality of the produce. <laughs> well, if you haven't figured it out, this is the festival episode of Stardew Valley. Leo and I are here today to talk through all of the many, many festivals that take place in Pelican Town. And prepare yourself. This is, I'm excited to say, the first lore party episode that is seven hours long. No, I'm just kidding. This is going to be quick. It's going to be fun. <laughs> we'll go through some of these topics, talk about what works, what doesn't work, maybe what works better than in the real world. It's pretty exciting. Yeah, I'm stoked. And we should just jump right into it because there's a lot of ground to cover. And I figured the easiest thing to do would be to just go chronologically. So let's start right at the top. The first festival that takes place is early in spring, and that's the egg hunt, which I wrote down in my notes was a better name than Easter. I, I could not agree more. Like, <laughs> oh my God. It's just drop all pretense. It's about the eggs. It's about finding the eggs. It's about food. Like, it's a big old party. The mini game of finding the eggs has its challenges, but the overall event is just joyous and light and fun. Yeah, I would say this is one of the most lighthearted events. I mean, all of the festivals in Pelican Town are pretty lighthearted, except for the uh, one or two exceptions. But this one is a lot of fun, and it seems like most of the town is having a blast. Totally, yeah. And this applies to pretty much every festival, but this was your first chance to sort of explore the town. There's no time limit. You can just spend as much time as you want talking to people and getting a feeling for who's who and what they like. And this is when you start seeing some of these characters come to life. People like Clint, who kind of stays off to the side, he's a little bit shy and doesn't really feel like he can engage with the socialization. Maybe it's because he likes Emily. He's carrying a torch for Emily. I don't know why I'm whispering. I'm afraid he'll hear me maybe. <laughs> yeah, and you bring up a good point. A lot of the characters seem to do similar things in a majority of the festival. Clint, like you said, seems to be a bit of a loner. He's a little bit sad. He has a thing for Emily, which comes up in one of the festivals later on in winter, and you start to learn about his crush on Emily, but some of the other characters have similar archetypes that they fill. So Linus is the homeless guy who's always off in the corner, feels like he's not invited, but he's still part of the town. Penny, my love Penny, is of course just pure and wonderful and enjoys every part of every festival <laughs> and only sees the joy in life. As an open invitation, if you haven't heard our first two episodes, go back and listen. We've shared a lot of, I feel, personal, kind of deep truths, and we're on this journey together, all of us. Absolutely. But one of the most important characters that we have to talk about when it comes to the Egg Festival specifically is Abigail. And I wanted to pose this question to you, Leo, because you are the keeper of knowledge. Sure. Why is Abigail so damn good at finding these eggs? She wins every year. <laughs> She's clearly the daughter of the wizard. So she has like egg finding powers. Accio eggs. <laughs> yeah. Straight up Harry Potter Accio eggs. And they're just coming to her. I've, I've been through two egg festivals in my playthrough so far. Both times. So the first time, it's your, it's your first festival and you don't really know what's going on. You're a bit confused. You don't, you don't know the layout of the town. You can be forgiven for not finding the correct number of eggs and losing to Abigail. But year two, I was ready for that shit. I was like, I memorized where the first couple eggs were. I know the exact path I'm going to take through the town to optimize my eggs. And I lost again. She has to be cheating. I'm convinced Abigail <laughs> is using magical powers to find these eggs. I feel like I, I see in my mind's eye you practicing the egg run on off days. You're like in the rain <laughs> to the Rocky theme, trying to hunt down those eggs just to make sure that you're ready to just 
wipe her out entirely, and then she beats you because she has the power of the occult. You are not incorrect. That is that is absolutely <laughs> true. But I'm coming up on my third egg festival. I just started year three in my playthrough. Nice. I'm going to win this one, Leo. I believe in I'm you. I'm going to win this one. I believe in you. You got this. <laughs> so the other festival that takes place in spring, of course, is the Flower Dance Festival. Each season has two festivals. The first one in spring, Egg Festival. Second one is the Flower Dance. And I feel like this is more your speed, Leo. Or am I wrong on that? I have never felt as much anxiety and <laughs> as, I, as I did going into this game, this, uh, this little thing. Because you... you you know, you go off to this special little area in the cinder sap forest and everybody's there. And I'm, you know, carrying a little flame for a certain somebody and uh, Mayor Lewis knows who. And uh, <laughs> I'm looking around and everybody's kind of talking and I go forth and I bear my soul to this person. And I say, please, will you dance with me? And they're like, no. And then I get to watch them dance with someone else. Oh, uh. brutal. Oh I mean, year God. two, I, I made it up. to high school all over again. Oh my God, right? What's important to note is this takes place in an area that's completely off limits outside of this festival. All of the other festivals take place in areas that you can normally access during the game. This happens across the bridge behind the wizard's tower, I believe. Right. I'm definitely with you there on the anxiety. Year one at this festival, I was running around asking everyone and anyone to just dance with me because I didn't want to be the guy without the partner. And of course, I ended up the guy in the corner standing next to Clint, <laughs> two lonely dudes looking at these beautiful couples dancing it out. If you look this up on that kind of topic, the, one of the trivia bits on the Wikipedia page for this festival says it is technically possible to get a date to the flower dance in the first year, which is interesting that that's like fun trivia. It's like, hey, guess what? You're not absolutely guaranteed to be lonely and sad. You're just most likely going to be lonely <laughs> and sad. Yeah, I was just reading an article recently about Stardew Valley where this guy introduced his girlfriend to Stardew Valley for the first time. He played in a very hectic style. His farm was a mess. He just sort of casually did whatever he wanted to because that's the type of person he was. His girlfriend, on the other hand, extremely organized person, she ran her farm like an operation. He described it like she introduced Jeff Bezos to Stardew Valley. Oh my God. And I think to tie that back to the flower dance, I feel like both of you and I, if we're going to get even more personal here, probably didn't have the best experiences on the dance floor growing up. And that reflects in the flower dance festival. And it has for, <laughs> the, <laughs> it has for both of the years that I attended the festival in my playthrough. One thing that I did want to bring up and mention, though, is once you're married, you don't actually have to dance with your partner, which I think is interesting and sort of gives us a clue into the significance of the flower dance. It doesn't seem like it's a thing just for couples, and it doesn't seem like it's sexualized in any way. Right. It just seems like a town coming together and people dancing and enjoying the spring weather, enjoying each other's company and moving their bodies. It doesn't seem like a thing where you need a date or it needs to be something romantic. Well, you'd think with stakes that low, it'd be easier to get a dance the first year. <laughs> Why is it so hard? <laughs> well, leaving our bitter feelings behind, we should move on from the flower <laughs> dance. Let's leave our high school years and our, um, our teenage years behind us, Leo. We are grown men. We're past this. Like all grown men, we've come at last to our luau. Yes, we've moved on to the summertime and now we're on the beach. Which is just lovely. I mean, they've like carpeted the ground in lo what look like palm fronds. There's a big old thing of soup, which I mean, as far as like summer meals is low on my list, but you know, whatever, Pelican Town, like it's cool. Someone's like, it's hot out, what do you want? I'm not like, ah, eh, soup. That's so true, that's absolutely, even if you're sick during the summertime, it's like, nah, I'm gonna skip the soup, I'll just have another popsicle. I'd rather die. <laughs> <laughs> so the main event at the luau that takes place on the beach is that the governor is in town, and this is important to note that this is the first time that anyone outside of Pelican Town is coming into town. Yeah. And it's the governor of all people. He's coming into town, everyone's got a potluck soup, and everyone gets to introduce an ingredient to it, and then the governor gets to taste it, and we're all trying to please him. 
Why are we trying to please him, Leo? That's my question. That's my burning question. It's hard to say. I mean, he's coming in. He's he's. You don't really get to know him. He has a couple of responses that are pretty generic. He doesn't really give a lot away about himself. It's not like, this reminds me of my childhood. It's all very like, this is good. This is not so good. He's a mystery, isn't he? Yeah, I mean, there's really no lore to try and dig up about the governor. He's nameless. There's not even a name to try to get to know. He He's just the governor. He's wearing a purple suit and a purple top hat. He arrives during the luau. He tastes the soup. And depending on what you add to the soup, he'll have a couple of different reactions to it. And then these reactions will translate into friendship points for you with everybody in town. So I was curious because... You know, mayor can be sort of a, an aff affectionate term. You can be like, oh, that's the mayor. And is he really an elected official? Like, who's to say? But when we are introduced to the governor, this establishes solid hierarchy of government. And I was looking this up, and it looks like the governor in their respective state is like third most precedent, like someone with the third most precedence within their state next to vice president and president. Interesting. Yeah, we don't know how the government of the Ferngill Republic works at all. This is right. pretty much the only clue outside of Mayor Lewis, who, like you said, may or may not actually be a mayor. He's, it's a small enough town to where that might just be a title that folks have given him over the years. Right. But the governor coming in for the luau is our first glimpse into the government structure of the Ferngill Republic. And it establishes two points of reference, because just the mayor could be sort of that anomaly. It could be people saying, well, he's the oldest, he's been around the longest, he's got the most connections, he's the mayor. Yeah, we call that's what we call him. But when you are introduced to another form of government, another government official, then suddenly we've got a line. We've got direction. We do. But again, there's, there's not a whole lot to dig up there. He shows up, he eats the soup, he judges the soup, and he leaves. So the second festival that takes place in the summer is the Dance of the Moonlight Jellies. And I'm curious to know your opinion. I think this is one of the least interesting festivals that takes place in the entire game. This is why I love podcasting with you, because we'll get to it later, but this is my favorite. It is unique in as much as there is almost nothing to do. You just talk to people. There isn't really an event of any sort. There's no game. Right. There aren't really prizes. You just kind of, it's a, it's a, sort of an observance of a natural phenomenon. You know, everybody kind of comes out, there are these jellyfish that float through, and you see them, and then you leave. Right, and that basically lays out bullet point for bullet point why I think it's the least interesting of the festivals. There's virtually nothing to do, and more to the point of lore, I think the jellyfish themselves aren't really explored or explained at all in the world. This is the one event where they show up unless I've missed a library book or missed something in my research. I don't think the concept of these sort of magical jellyfish ever comes up again. Well, yeah, no, and it's worth mentioning because you mentioned they're magical. The wizard dialogue regarding the jellyfish, he says, I'm here to observe the lunaloos or moonlight jellies as you call them. They possess an unusually potent magical aura for an aquatic life form, which is kind of cool. I mean, it, it just suggests that these are not Strictly speaking, jellyfish, uh, that they are in fact some form of magical beast. But when we get later on, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of elaborate a little bit why I like it so much. But yeah, that's that's the uh, that's the Moonlight Jelly Festival. Yeah, later in the episode, we're going to discuss our favorite festivals. But for now, let's move on to the fall because the fair is in town, and this is an absolute blast. I agree. It's a lot of fun. It's hard to compete with the Grange event. And again, Abu, you pulled up recently the word Grange. It's a popular word, used a lot, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. If you lived anywhere between 1850 and the 1900s, Grange was a word you were dropping left and right. I remember the days. <laughs> Grange this, Grange that. Don't look at my Grange. What's that Grange doing there? Drop it like it's Grange. Yeah, there were a lot of great sayings back in the day. I'm sad that the word has dropped off in popularity ever since the 1900s. These kids don't know how good we had it. <laughs> <laughs> the Grange is like a, a display trough that you put your produce on or your different things on to show the quality of the stuff that you're producing at your farm, basically. 
Yeah, it's one of the many competitions that take place at the Stardew Valley Fair. And I think that's what I like the most about this fair is that there's so much to do in comparison to the other festivals. I mean, there's the, the fishing mini game, there's the bullseye mini game, there's the gambling mini game where I lost all of my star tokens at the last festival. I mean, there's so much to do at this festival that I just don't understand how everyone in town isn't just looking forward to it all year. So we were talking before we started recording that gambling is, is just the worst. I mean, I think I lost an embarrassing number of uh, star token things uh, <laughs> just trying my luck. And I discovered I had none. So I went to the skill-based games like the shooting and the fishing. I discovered pretty quickly that the fishing game was a reliable way of earning. But just doing that for like 30 minutes sounded like an actual nightmare. <laughs> so instead, I did the uh, the shooting game, which... I felt a sort of gratification in timing the shots perfectly and like hitting the targets perfectly. It was kind of a nice step away from the normal, very leisurely pace of the game. I actually felt the opposite, and here we go again, <laughs> agreeing to disagree, but yeah. I thought the shooting game was more frustrating, and I just got so annoyed that I could not hit the targets that I wanted to, so I wasn't making as many points as I wanted to. But the fishing game, I was incredible at. But I do want to point out that the first year, I didn't have a Grange display. Right. Because I didn't know what that word meant. <laughs> <laughs> and then the second year, I was prepared. And I think that was one of the most fun parts of preparing for this festival in particular, was sort of gathering together the nine objects I would put on display, figuring out how exactly I would flex on everyone in town and show them up, <laughs> and just brag about all the dope stuff that I was creating on my farm. And I killed it. I won that Grange display year two. Way to go, Abu. <laughs> it, interestingly, you know, th th being a video game, this has to have numerical values for the things that you contribute to your Grange. But because a lot of that stuff isn't made explicitly clear, I often found myself, even when I found out that I won, I was like, oh my God, am I going to win? That person has so many pieces of cloth or like, oh my gosh. They have <laughs> fish. They've got so much fish. How am I going to beat them? They've got so much One fish. of the Grange displays has an entire cheese wheel, not just a slice of cheese. That's crazy. How are you going to top that? Marnie, <laughs> where did you get all that cheese? You only have two cows and they look skinny as hell. <laughs> where are you getting this cheese? <laughs> One other thing I wanted to bring up was the fact that this is the first time that you encounter other people from outside of town that aren't just the governor. There's tourists. Yeah, it's interesting to see these people around because you can definitely play this game and kind of get the unspoken impression that Stardew Valley is very much cut off from the world. But here's an event that actually draws people in. So this is clearly like a big event that has some draw. So this does hint at the grander scheme of the world or the grander scale of the world and how maybe Stardew Valley, this sleepy little town, is not so little after all. Yeah, it, it all adds into the world building and the larger universe that is Stardew Valley that Concerned Ape crafted. So let's move on to the final event that takes place in the fall, and that's Spirits Eve, otherwise known in the real world as Halloween. There's pumpkins everywhere, <laughs> and they're carved. <laughs> totally. It is a on-the-nose reference, absolutely. But it does have some kind of interesting elements, because obviously there's a lot of, there's like, some skeletons that the Adventurers Club, like, took out of the mines in order to keep them on display, right? That seems real dangerous. There are children in this town. <laughs> I was going to say that, I mean, this is the beginning of an episode of Walking Dead or something. Like, that's, that is not a, not a good plan. But the maze, and this is, I love this, the maze, which is set up by the wizard. And as you explore the maze, you'll actually notice the wizard's, like, looking down over the maze and over the festival, just kind of looking on from a from a high place. And Abu, why don't you tell everybody who's standing next to the wizard? Well, it's our old boy, the homeless man in town, scruffy, white beard, yellow clothes, Linus, Yoba. otherwise known as AKA Yoba. Yoba. <laughs> Yoba. <laughs> 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 Take a shot. Well, I mean, you have to you have to explain the hidden dialogue that is between them that you can't actually activate, I think, or right. there might be a way to glitch it to happen. But there is some written lines of dialogue between the two of them that just confirms, in my mind, confirms that Linus is Yoba. All right, so get this. 
The wizard can't be reached, but in the game's data files, he has dialogue that says, The affairs of mundane folk matter little to me, but the elementals like a chance to see you up close. It was for them that I created this silly maze. So the wizard made this maze for the elementals, and then Linus, who's standing at his side, says, Good show, old friend. Old friend? Yoba. Yoba confirmed. Yeah, if you're if you're uh, if you're playing the the age old drink every time it's confirmed that Linus is Yoba, drink. <laughs> you know what? Just finish off the rest of the shots because we just confirmed it undeniably. <laughs> and if you haven't understood any of the references we're making yet, go back listen to the first Stardew episode we did about hidden lore. There is a pretty strong theory that says Linus is a Yoba. And Yoba is the creator deity in Stardew Valley. He's God. And Linus may be God. It is one of my favorite theories from that episode. It's so good. One final thing I do want to say about the Spirits Eve Festival before we move on to wintertime. Sure. I want to just give props to Gus. And this actually goes for every festival. Gus does a lot of the cooking. All of the meals that we see just laid out on these tables at all of these festivals are made by Gus. He's doing a lot of work in this town, and I think he deserves props. Yeah, way to go, Gus. You don't get enough credit. One last thing for me. Abigail, clearly the daughter of the wizard, uh, refuses to go into the maze. I suspect maybe she's sensitive to the spirits and thus, you know, doesn't feel comfortable around them. Another theory confirmed here on Lore Party. We have just confirmed two of our theories from the first episode. If you have not completed all of your shots, now is the time to do it. <laughs> <laughs> responsibly. Drink them all, but responsibly. Yeah, 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 of course. We don't condone irresponsible drinking here on Laura Party. But we do condone responsible ice fishing at the Festival of Ice. Hey! Hey. <laughs> That's called a segue. Worst segue ever. But you're right. We should move on to the winter time. We got two more festivals to go through. We cannot let this episode be seven hours long. That was a joke that we made at the beginning. We cannot make it reality. Oh, we could. We could. We really could. But speaking of the Festival of Ice, you're right. This is the first festival that takes place in the winter time, and it's the one where you get to ice fish. We've talked about this. Uh, I'm a fan of the fishing kind of mechanic. I know you're a fan of it. You said you're really good at it. So, uh, if any of you see Abu fishing, feel free to challenge him to it. But the, uh, th there's this uh, fishing competition, and it's fun. You get to kind of fish, and if you, like me, realized that fishing is a great, great way to make money, you are very practiced at it, so you just roll in and you dab on those haters. <laughs> but I agree. The fishing part of this festival is my favorite part. It makes it one of my favorite festivals as well because it's so incredibly easy for me to win because, like you have said many, many times, I am the greatest fisher alive. Yeah, true. <laughs> so there are some kind of fun trivia bits about this festival. One of them is a possible Godzilla quote. The, wow, that's a lot of fish quote that uh, Mayor Lewis says could be a, a 1998 Godzilla reference, which is kind of cool. And then Abigail, she mentions her snow people or snowmen are snow goons, which again, could be a reference, could be, to 1991, Calvin and Hobbes, where Calvin builds several mutant snow goons, because it's, uh, it's the attack of the deranged mutant killer monster snow goons, which is the name of the collection. Um, <laughs> and then finally, again, adorable, Abigail, if you're married to her and you talk to her at her snowmen, She'll say, hey, honey, look, it's you, which, oh, that's just sweet. She made you, but out of snow, because she's a wizard. I have to admit, I don't get either of those references. But speaking of what the characters are doing during this festival, this is the first time that you see Clint interact with Emily, and you get a very clear picture of his affection for her. Because Emily and him are at a half-built snowman, I believe, and they're constructing the snowman together, and you go up and talk to Clint, and Clint says, oh, Emily just walked over here unprompted and started helping me build this snowman. Do you think that means something? Leo, you're the professional. Do you think that means something? I mean, if nothing else, Clint, it shows that you're destined to have a strong friendship with her. Doesn't mean nothing romantically, but, you know, she, she chose to go over to you and help you with your thing even though it was probably bad because you're used to working with hot things and not cold things because you're a blacksmith. 
that's why his snowman is awful and Emily <laughs> needed to help him out. Everybody's like, oh, there's sad, lonely Clint and his shitty snowman. <laughs> <laughs> Poor, poor Clint. We've been ribbing on him quite a bit this episode. He's great. I but one other shout out that I want to give, one other person that is always positive at these festivals is Evelyn. We haven't talked much about her, but at this festival in particular, when you go up and talk to Evelyn, she tells you how her and George first met, and it's adorable. They met when George threw a snowball at her. Seems appropriate. <laughs> Absolutely appropriate for George. I mean, in at every single festival... He's just absolutely cranky. And then when you talk to Evelyn, she's nostalgic. I mean, these two have been here their entire lives. They've been in Pelican Town. They've been in Stardew Valley their entire lives. And it's a vision of what you and Leah or me and Penny could be as we grow older. And again, George is one of those characters. He's kind of grumpy and gruff. But the more you become friends with him, the more you get to see he's, you know, he's a nice guy. Absolutely. So let's move on to the final festival of the year and this one takes place at the end of winter specifically on the 25th of winter i'm not quite sure why that is do you know why i have no clue i was raised buddhist i have no idea i think it's because if you add two and five it becomes seven i think you're onto something that might be it <laughs> but in the game it's called feast of the winter star and there's a legend of the winter star there's a bunch of candy canes everywhere for some reason they put up this tree with a giant star at the top i really don't understand these weird rituals it must be a yoba thing yeah but this is another festival that's very colorful very cheery it reminds me of the egg festival in a lot of ways there's a ton of delicious looking food out on tables there's gifts everywhere and the most important part of this festival is the secret gift exchange you're assigned to a random person in town, and you have to present them with a gift. My first year, I already had sort of, I mean, by, by winter, I had my sort of solid opinions of everybody in town. I feel like I was assigned to give Pam a gift, and I was just the most disappointed. <laughs> I wanted to give a gift to someone I liked. I wanted to give a gift to someone I didn't know much about. And they're like, Pam. I'm like, ah, damn it. All right, fine. I mean, she's an easy person to give a gift to, though. I mean, you just brew up some wine, you make some beer. She's going to love it. She's the alcoholic in town. One of the, like, three. W one of many alcoholics in town, definitely. But I agree with you. The gift-giving part of this festival is the most stressful to me, at least. I'm always looking forward to giving somebody in town that I like a fun gift. And then last year, I got Alex. And I was like, what the hell do I buy Alex? <laughs> But I think it is a nice little exchange of gifts. And I like that you also receive a gift from a random person. So it's not a one-way street. Somebody else in town is assigned to you and you receive a gift. So it, it's, a, it's a season of giving. And I hope in future, because the characters that you will never receive gifts from are the dwarf, Krobus, Marlin, Sandy, and the wizard. I would love to get some juicy item from one of them that tells more about their history you know with maybe flavor text or maybe it's like very specific yeah like that maybe explains some of their background or it gives us some more insight into the lore that's a potential idea that could happen in an update concerned ape if you're listening it's gonna say concerned ape i think that'd be pretty dope i think it is important for us to discuss very briefly the legend of the winter star because that's what this festival is named after if you go over and talk to willie i believe he actually explains what the legend is. And the basic gist is that there's a certain star in the sky that's only visible from Stardew Valley. So a lot of people would come to Pelican Town to witness this star. And I, I think that is just another example of these festivals opening up the larger world and the larger lore behind Stardew Valley. Totally. And it's that sort of return to nature and it's an appreciation of approximate holidays and the sort of community that exists around them without some of the like faith-based elements because unless it's directly related to yoba nothing's really discussed in the in the uh, in the game so to wrap up this episode we've talked through every single festival that takes place in pelican town what is your favorite festival so i know this might be a little bit off the wall but it speaks a lot to who i am i loved the dance of the moonlight jellies and hear me out, the game, the whole game 
is very easy to fall into rhythms of I'm doing this, I'm doing that. I wake up, I water my crops. I wake up, I talk to those people. I go to the mines, I'm fishing. It's all very action oriented. You're, you're kind of going through the world. And as we've experienced, you can play this game for like 70 hours and not really touch on what is happening underneath that sort of surface, right? The Dance of the Moonlight Jellies is the first time you're given this experience that is entirely sensory. It's like you walk into this space, everybody is kind of quietly looking out to the ocean, which is just kind of beautiful in its own way. Everybody's kind of come together for nature. And then you wander around, you talk to people, uh, get some fun flavor text from the wizard. And then you watch Mayor Lewis light the, uh, the little boat, the little lantern boat, and he sends it out and it guides the jellyfish in to frame. This sweet song plays and it's like a little cutscene, and it's just, it, it feels kind of mythical or it feels kind of like there's a, there's a gravitas to it, which was one of the first times that I was like, oh, maybe there is some depth to this game. And I just liked, I just liked the experience. It was good. Leo, that was beautiful. The next time the jellies arrive, I'll be thinking of that. But my favorite festival, and this won't come as a surprise, was the Stardew Valley Fair. There's just so much to do. There's so much excitement. The tourists are in town. You can win prizes. There's games. There's gambling where I lose all my star tokens. <laughs> I just love that this is the most lively festival. Yeah. It's also during fall, which is one of my favorite seasons. And the, you know, the fall colors are in full bloom. I just love the fair. And it was a blast. And that that's my favorite festival. And I think that speaks to the types of people that we are. I like to be very active. I like to have a dozen things happening at the same time and a dozen different things to do on my to-do list for that day. And I rarely ever take a moment to just sit, relax, and look at the jellies. And maybe that's a learning lesson for me. That about wraps it up for this episode. We want to thank you for tuning in and being a part of the show. Be sure to connect with us on Twitter at lore underscore party and leave us a review on iTunes. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.